And broadly, it's an attempt by me and by Lisa Opinionese um, to get artists and scientists to listen to and respond to each other in an attempt to further our understanding of mind and brain. I'm hoping this will be especially possible today because the topic is empathy, and so we'll all be at our most empathetic. Um, and because we really couldn't have three more exciting, appropriate, um, and eminent speakers um, to address this question. Chris Friff is Emeritus Professor of Neuropsychology at the Wellcome Centre for Neuroimaging at UCL and a Fellow of All Souls Oxford. And he's a pioneer in the use of brain imaging to the study of mental processes. He's the author of more than 400 academic papers, which is a terrifying number as an academic. Um, and also of a recent book called Making Up the Mind, How the Brain Creates Our Mental World, which I'd really recommend as a very engaging take on the neuroscientific mind. And I started reading this book in preparation for today um, and was somewhat unnerved to find that much of the book is written as an imaginary dialogue with an extremely naive professor of English. Um, <laughs> and um, he, sets, he sets about trying to sort of rid her of her assumption that literary types know more than neuroscientists about the true nature of consciousness. But luckily, we'll have no such assumptions today. Um, and luckily, also, I was very pleased to find that, in fact, their relationship becomes much less rebarbative, largely because it seems to take place over a series of drinks parties in which the wine flows plentifully. So I've tried to ply Chris with drink before we started, but sadly, he only took the tea. Um, Darian Leader is a very eminent psychoanalyst working in London and a founder member of the Centre for Freudian Analysis and Research. He's the president of the College of Psychoanalysts UK and is the author of several wonderfully, wonderful and also very brilliantly titled books, including Why Do Women Write More Letters Than They Post? What Art Stops Us From Seeing? Why Do People Get Ill? And What Is Madness? Fiona Shaw is, of course, one of our most acclaimed actors um, for stage and screen, as well as a very talented director. Her range is vast, spanning Greek tragedy to broad comedy, from Electra, The Taming of the Shrew, Hedda Gabler, London Assurance, to Harry Potter. And she's also recently added directing opera to her many talents, um, with brilliant productions of Elegy for Young Lovers and Marriage of Figaro. And we're especially grateful that she's here tonight, because she's currently starring in Rep at the National, in, um, in Howard Barker's Scenes from an Execution, which is a really extraordinary and, I imagine, extremely exhausting um, performance, and you still have a chance to catch it, I think, very briefly. Um, and she may tell us a bit about it, or certainly about other roles tonight. So the format for the evening is that each of our speakers will talk for five minutes. I will direct a discussion between them, and then we will open to questions from the floor, and then there'll be a drinks reception to which we'd love you to come um, outside. So just before they talk, um, they start, I wanted to just give um, everyone a couple of definitions of empathy to sort of bear in the back of our minds. Um, largely because I think we all, Fiona was saying earlier as well, that once you start sort of Googling empathy, it becomes a, a, quite a minefield, particularly because um, sympathy was, was the word originally used in the English language for what we now see as empathy. Um, Hume, in the 18th century, um, described sympathy as the process by which affections pass from one creature to another and beget correspondent movements in every human creature. So that was a propensity to pick up on the feelings of others. The Oxford English Dictionary describes sympathy as an affinity between certain things um, by virtue of which they're similarly or correspondingly affected by the same influence. Um, so sympathy was the main word used until the Germans came up with the word Einfühlung, um, meaning feeling into, in 1873, originally to describe art, how we're moved into art and feel our way into it. Um, this then entered the English language in 1909, and the Oxford English Dictionary now defines empathy as the power of projecting one's personality into, and so fully comprehending the object of contemplation. So there's a big debate about whether to use sympathy and empathy and in what context, about whether each of them is voluntary or involuntary, about whether empathy involves an identification and a blurring of selves, or whether we retain during empathy the distinction between self and other, all of which may come into our discussion. So now, without further ado, I would like to turn to Fiona. Will you tell me when I've spoken for five minutes? I will. <laughs> um, good evening. Well, I thought I might be useful to this discussion 
not because I would know any science or any conclusions, but because I am, as an actress, have two relationships to empathy. One is something I can do nothing about, which is that the audience may, we hope, empathize with the characters that the actor is playing. This has been so hijacked by the personality of the actor that it, doesn't, it no longer really functions as a sort of true uh, communication between the audience and the actor. I mean, it does, but it is, it's connected to charm and all sorts of things where people are given a pathway into a character whilst also knowing that the person playing the character is in control of the character. But the more private relationship to empathy is the one that I have, is how I find a play in the first place, how I find any parts that I might want to play. So sometimes people suggest parts to you. They say, you know, they, at the moment, uh, for no particular reason, people keep saying, why did you play Cleopatra? And they think, because I'm too young. <laughs> like, no, I'm new, you're not. Um, but if I were to, uh, the, the, what I would do is I would take the play of Antony Cleopatra and I would start to read it. And oddly, I would not mind whether it was my part or another part. I would just wait for a line or a word that suddenly affects me. And I've always had this relationship to it. And it could be that the word that I might pick, although for me there are famous phrases on the anti Cleopatra, a part I haven't played. Uh, you know, you know, he rode the storm the, or with the seas like a colossus. I mean, there are all sorts of famous things. I am dying, Egypt dying. There are sort of wonderful phrases that have no particular informational power or psychological obvious connection. I'm dying, Egypt dying. You think Shakespeare never even went to Egypt, but somehow this phrase holds meaning. And it is, it is in this sort of emotional illogicality that one finds one's place, that one empathizes, finds the point of contact, and it's what I call plumb lines. So I'm just going to give you a few examples, and it may be of use to the discussion, but when I played Catherine in The Taming of the Shrew, it's a stupid play, The Taming of the Shrew, and it should rarely, rarely be done. It's not a good play, and clearly Shakespeare wrote it to make a lot of money. It has very little poetry, and the only poetry in it is at the very end, actually, where Catherine finally finds her voice, having been freed or tamed, and she says, you know, fie, fie, on it, that threatening, unkind brow, and dart not scornful glances from those eyes, to wound thy lord, thy king, thy governor, it blots thy beauty as frost do bite the meats, blah, blah. She speaks in a kind of phrasing that nobody else has spoken in during the entire play. It's as if he suddenly thought, I better write a poem now, so suddenly a poem would be. <laughs> But very early on in that play, I'd agreed to play it for Dr. Jonathan Miller, who was very keen on the psychoanalytic element of the shrew, and decided that Catherine was a patient and that Petruchio was a doctor. And he talked about the Havistock Clinic and you know, that some children would come in behaving very badly, and sometimes the doctor would take um, the desk and throw the desk over, and that would shock the child who was delinquent in its behavior. I fundamentally don't feel the plays are about neurosis. I feel they're about people. They're about the stresses of people. They're about the pendulum swing of experience, which pushes the emotional area to its utmost before madness. I don't think the moment they reach madness, uh, then you call in doctors, and you're not really watching a play. You're watching a patient. So I'm very keen. I wasn't so keen on that idea that, 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 they, that the thing about Catherine the Shrew is she needed a doctor. She needed, she needed her identity. And it was a line, this is not at all intellectual. I didn't like what I was reading. I'll kick your noddle with a three-legged stool, she says. Really ugly phrases. But like a sort of lion, Petruchio is released into her. And he says, good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. And she says, well have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine, that do talk of me. And I was so moved, having had all the bias against this play, that this young woman wanted to be called her name. In fact, everyone calls her Kate. But she wants to be called Catherine. And in that moment, I knew that there was a real person in the play who was desperate to get out. And it didn't matter how foolish her language was, how silent she was going to have to be during Act Three when the so-called battle of the sexes results in Petruchio mutilating her with seven 
I think, five-sevenths of the language of the play, and she has about one-seventh, and the other characters for the other seventh. Um, it is not a battle of the sexes. It is a complete onslaught of Catherine by Petruchio, but we will leave that be for tonight. But at that moment of they call me Catherine, they do talk of me, I knew who she was. Similarly, in As You Like It, when I played Rosalind, there's a phrase that takes more breath than any other phrase, which is that Rosalind says to Orlando, who's you know, testing her whether she loves him or not, she says, no, no, Orlando, men are April when they woo, December when they weds, May are May when it is May, but the sky changes when they are wives. And something about that phrase made me know that I could meet her. I didn't analyze it. It's nothing to do with my history or who I am. And so too with, Kath, with um, Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing, is that famously, you know, she laughs all the time. And there's a wonderful scene where finally she has a battle with her potential lover, um, um, Benedict, who she's really scoffed all the way through. And he says, Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? She goes, yea, and I will weep a while longer. I would not desire that. You have no reason. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. Ah, how much might the man deserve of me that would write her? She speaks in this battle, and she, she's always embattled with him. But early on in the play, somebody says, you're always laughing, more or less. That's what they say. And she says, no. Uh, he's, you, were under, you were born under a wonderful star or something. She says, no. Sure, my mother cried, but then a star danced, and under that I was born. And I knew when I read that, that I knew who she was. And it's not that I was a star danced when I was born, but something about the person is in profound contradiction to the rest of their behavior. And at that moment of disjuncture between what we decide they are and who they really are, in this strange vacuum, is where the actress steps in and brings herself. And uh, I, I mean, I could give you endless examples, but probably the most interesting thing, perhaps for this discussion, is that I played Medea some years ago, where everyone feels that Medea is a bad person, because very early on she says, I'll kill the children. And I remembered, and she doesn't, you know, because the play has an hour and a half to go and a lot of plots and turns before she kills the children. But my mother often used to say, if you don't come in for your supper, I'll annihilate you. <laughs> um, a woman built on understatement. And I realize that many mothers say they're going to kill their children. It doesn't mean for one minute they are. They actually would kill for their children. And for me, the empathetic point was the fact that she said, I'll kill the children, is that I felt she was absolutely saying the opposite. She was saying, I feel so badly about you, Jason. I feel I could kill the children but that she wouldn't say the phrase if she had intended to kill the children. And therefore, when she does kill the children, she kills them for quite another reason. She kills them to save them from other people who might kill her children. And it is in that dark place of the human mind that curses when we tell somebody to F off or whatever we, you know, when we say, God, I had a really shit day last, yesterday. You think, shit is a terrible word to be using about a day. That these phrases sometimes belie our desire to disguise something, and sometimes they reveal a real truth about who we are. And it's all in the imaginative relationship of the moment of empathy. And I'll conclude by saying that some years ago, I had my brain scanned, again by the Wellcome Trust, and uh, was performing just a few lines from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And during these lines, the character in the poem, who is Mrs. Eliot, um, says pretty well, because we know this, because in the margin of the poem, she has written the phrase, wonderful, as if Thomas Stearns Eliot has really captured some truth about their life. He has written a piece where he's taken ordinary speech and turned it into poetry that sounds like ordinary speech. This is the same trick Shakespeare used to do, to take ordinary speech, put it into the iambic pentameter, and yet when you hear it, you think somebody has just spoken it and hasn't minted it. And she says, my nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What? Thinking what? I never knew what you were thinking. Think. He says, I think we are in Rat's Alley where the dead men lost their bones. Now, during that little section, for me to be able to say, my nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. 
stay with me, speak to me. I have to see the woman. And I see her at my mother's dressing table. My mother has a dressing table that makes Hiroshima look like a sort of neat garden. My mother's dressing table has never been mended in 45 years. There are bits of lipstick, there's hairpins, there's bits of perfumes. A bit earlier, we hear about the unguent powders and perfumes belonging to this woman, which is kind of Cleopatra and kind of T.S. Eliot's wife. So I did, I was taken by that as my mother's dressing table, which has got a sort of baize now worn down to nothing, lined with a sort of inlaid thing, it's a huge mirror, and uh, a picture of herself very nearby. She's very keen on herself, my mother. So I think somewhere my mother was in my mind when I go, my nerves are bad tonight, yes, bad, stay with me, speak to me, why do you never speak? And my mother has a very big bedroom with two Georgian windows. So I'm often, when I say those lines in the poem, I'm in that room, my mother's bedroom, the two Georgian windows, the dressing table, because I must as a child remember her getting ready in front of this mirror, doing things like this. Oh, yes, I'm coming. Oh, come on. Oh, I must just get myself ready. But instead, I have this woman going, my nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? So I was, had my brain scanned while I said these lines. And what they found in my brain was, A, there was a brain, which I was so surprised at. <laughs> B, the bits that went yellow when uh, I spoke was, of course, the language section of the brain, just behind the ear. And uh, the other bit of the brain that went was, um, hmm, I can't remember now, um, language, definitely. Um, Oh yes, two things, two very interesting things. One is the lady's doing this in my mind. It's my mother, really. My nose back to her. She's absolutely good. One was the arms were going. Now, I was lying in an MRI scanner, just with my arms relaxed. But my arms were going in my brain. But the arms themselves were not twitching or in any way tense. They were just at ease. But most interestingly for me was the architecture part of the brain started to activate. So all I'm saying is my nerves are bad tonight? Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? And bo a body is moving in my brain. The language is moving in my brain. And the architecture is moving in my brain. And I think that is because the empathetic point for me is where I fuse my childhood, my parents, my experience, and new language. Thank you very much, Darian. Okay, thank you very much, Fiona. That was wonderful insight into your craft and your experience. Laura asked me to say something about how psychoanalysis views empathy. A difficult, if not impossible, task because there are many different traditions and schools of psychoanalysis, and many of them have radically different and generally incompatible theories of how the mind works and also theories of how practice ought to work. So what I'll do is just make a very, very simple contrast between two of the main traditions in psychoanalytic history. Is that not working? Okay. So I'll just contrast two different traditions within psychoanalytic history. More or less, one tradition which is based on a belief in empathy defined as more or less the capacity to enter into the emotional experience of someone else and to experience the same feelings that another human being has. Obviously, there are different definitions of empathy, but that's one that has been central to a particular current in analysis. And that current gained prominence in the early 1940s. By the mid-1950s, it was getting stronger and stronger. And today, there are many different traditions in the talking therapies which actually base their practice on the idea that the feelings that the analyst has, that the therapist has when they're in dialogue with a patient, are accurate reflections of the internal experiences of the patient, and hence, crucial point, that these can be used as a compass in the clinical work itself. So you're using what you feel to guide your work. Now, 
we can perhaps talk more about that later on, but that's a really important and in some parts of the world dominant tradition in analytic work. The other tradition, which starts out really with Freud and continues in the Freud students, starts out with the basic assumption that there's no such thing as empathy, that it's both dangerous and in some cases cruel to imagine that we can know anything about the internal world, about the emotional states of another person, and that what the concept of empathy blocks the person from doing, blocks the clinician from doing, is actually listening to the patient. So it's the idea that rather than assuming that your own feelings are a true guide to what's going on in the patient's mind, you have to obliterate that and question it as much as possible, put your own feelings in question, and rather listen to what the patient is saying and make your deductions and your inferences about their emotions, perhaps, or their thought processes from speech rather than from what you feel. And that, that's a very, very important difference between two traditions in analytic work. Now, on the side of the tradition which believes that we can enter into the emotional states of others, that there are many developments, some are quite crude and some are quite sophisticated. Today we have something called theory of mind, which I guess we'll probably talk about at some point in the discussion. But generally, if we want to find a, a very simple, uh, well-known example of how it works, you can think of the advert, the TV advert for Mazda cars. It's something that they show in the cinemas and on TV a lot, where you see a guy loading female mannequins into the back of his car. And he drives along and he's obviously enjoying his ride. And at the end of his journey, he gets out of the car and he takes the mannequins out of the car. And miraculously, they've all now got erect nipples. And you can see that advert as a kind of model of some contemporary theories of empathy. Basically, it's the idea, this time gendered, that other people will experience the same thing as the driver of the car, that they'll get off on what he gets off on. Also, perhaps, there's the idea that they become aroused in the same way that he does, just as he might have an erection, so they have erect nipples. So basically, what the advert does is show a kind of erasal of any kind of difference that these, these mannequins or what they symbolize might actually not enjoy going in a man's car. They might not be turned on by that. And blood flow, the engorgement of an organ, might not actually be an index of arousal for them. Now, if you then turn to some other examples, we can take one from the history of psychology. In the 60s, there were a number of experiments where they showed, generally it was high school students or college students, a couple of movies. One was called Sub Incision. And this was a film in which an anthropologist assists at a ritual ceremony in which a piece of flint is inserted into a penis. The control for this film was a documentary about agriculture called Corn Farmer. Now, it's kind of interesting to think about because as far as I know, there are lots and lots and lots of horror movies set on corn farms. This children of the corn. There are a lot of movies where people find themselves in a cornfield and all sorts of terrible things happen. There are very few films in which people find themselves subject to a ritual of flint insertion. Anyway, what they found in one of these experiments was that when the subjects were instructed to empathize with the anthropologist who was assisting on the ritual, the distress was tempered. In other words, the empathy blocked the experience or one aspect of the traumatic experience for them. Whereas for those subjects who weren't instructed to empathize with the anthropologist, things were a bit more difficult. So that can suggest to us with that particular idea of empathy that the effort to put oneself in someone else's place can act as a defense against thinking about some more painful aspects of our existence. Another example from popular culture, I don't know if you've seen the Disney film Brave. 
very good film about the mother-daughter relation. And in this film, you have uh, the daughter in a royal family in Scotland whose mother wants her to be a kind of perfect princess and marry a prince and link the two families dynastically. She's not so interested in that. She manages to get her mother turned into a bear. And a lot of the film concerns the relation of this daughter to the bear. She wants the mother changed back from the bear into her mum. But at the same time, in the scenes where the daughter and the mother are together, there's always a margin of terror for her of whether the bear will see her as an edible morsel to be devoured or whether the mother will see her as her daughter. And a lot of the drama of the film revolves around that terrifying ambiguity, not knowing what she is for the other. And from a psychoanalytic perspective, this is one of the fundamental questions that infants have to confront in their lives, in their early existence, the question of what are they for the other. And one of the ways, arguably, that we block out that terrible question is through an appeal to processes involving empathy where we imagine we know what someone else is feeling, just as in this film. What's actually tempering for the girl is to imagine that her mother wants her to be a princess who marries a prince to join the dynasties rather than being simply a morsel of food to be devoured. You can imagine that's less traumatic to imagine that you have a place in a symbolic universe rather than you're more on the side of a real object that's going to be eaten. So the analytic idea would be that the idea of empathy is something that blocks out the traumatic dimension of asking, of posing the question of what we are for the other. Again, it's interesting to look at the, the gender questions here, because one could, one could guess, in fact, that this is something that women are much more alert to and open to than men. Men tend to deny the dimension of the desire of the other. They tend to remove that question from their lives, whereas many women talk about how open the question is of what their value is for the other, what they represent, what they are for someone else, for the other, or whatever embodies the other for them. And I think that when we look at some of the theories, the analytic theories from the first tradition that actually do buy into the concept of empathy, we see a very, very naive view, the idea that we kind of move up a developmental ladder by recognizing the fact that other people, our caregivers, have got mental states which are different from our own, and that gradually that allows us to form our own sense of self, gain an access to some notion of a shared reality. When if you think about you know, your own experience, let's say people who, who've been married for decades perhaps, there'll be plenty of cases where it's absolutely clear that each party has got no belief that their partner has a mental state that's different from their own, because people tend to believe that other people think like they do, even if on paper there'll be lip service to the idea that we recognize difference, that other people think differently from us. In practice, we find the opposite, that people do their best to ignore or deny or blot out the fact that other people have got belief systems different from their own. So to conclude, we can just say that from an analytic perspective, the concept of empathy is more or less a de defense or a diversion. What's much more interesting is to open up the question of different modes of identification, different ways involving both the mind and the body in which we put ourselves in the place of other people, sometimes at an emotional level, sometimes at other levels, and to look at the different forms of identification that are at play in development and in human relations, and to study those rather than follow what seems to be a very, very far-fetched idea that we can ever know anything for sure about what someone else is feeling. Thank you.
just heard about a more naive version of psychoanalysis. Now I'm going to tell you something really naive. But I want to start at the beginning because I was also surprised to discover how recently the word empathy came into the English language. And of course, Wikipedia is very useful for this. So my story is that it was first used by Vernon Lee in 1904, and she wanted it to describe her psychological theory of aesthetic experiences. So she believed that when people are looking at works of art, memories and associations are called up, which are accompanied by changes in bodily posture and breathing, which are often unconscious. And this is a bit like what Fiona was describing. In other words, people feel their way into works of art, which is why she translated this German word, Einfühlung, into empathy. But what I particularly like about Vernon Lee is that she was, a, before her time, an experimental psychologist. So she actually tried to measure these empathic responses. She went round art galleries, her friend Kit Anstrother Thompson, and tried to observe the changes in posture and breathing elicited by the works of art. So, of course, a hundred years later, when I started being interested in this, Vernon Lee was largely forgotten when neuroscientists started doing exactly the same thing, or very much the same thing, but this time using extremely expensive equipment. And instead of Vernon Lee, we were inspired by the discovery of mirror neurons at the end of the 20th century, which you probably know about. So, in the motor cortex of the monkey, and humans for that matter, there are neurons which fire and the animal makes a particular gesture. So one neuron fire with this gesture, another one might fire with that gesture. And Giacomo Rizzolati and his friends in Parma found by serendipity <coughs> that some of these neurons also fire when the monkey sees the experimenter making the same action. So the neuron fires when the monkey picked up a peanut, it also fires when the monkey sees the experimenter picking up a peanut. And very soon after that, Everybody was using brain imaging to share the same effects in humans. So when you look at somebody moving, there is actually activity in that part of your brain which you use when making those same movements, although you don't actually move, like Fiona was describing in scanners in her arms. But you might call this motor contagion, perhaps, rather than empathy. And this contagion does actually spill over into behavior. <coughs> So watching somebody else move will interfere with your moving. If I'm trying to move like this and I see somebody else moving like this, this movement becomes more varied. And of course it's not just movements that this happens for, it also happens with sensations. So for example, my friend Jamie Ward, who's an expert on synesthesia, discovered a new kind of synesthesia not long ago, where people, when they see someone's face being touched, they say, I feel a touch on my own face. There might even be one or two people here tonight with this sort of experience. And this sounded ideal for a scanning experiment because you could ask the question, does the bit of the cortex that lights up when they're touched also light up when they see somebody else being touched? And this is exactly what we found primary and secondary somatosensory cortex to be, to use the jargon, were activated when the volunteer was touched and also when he saw somebody else being touched in the same place. So face versus neck or left versus right would activate a different bits of the touch sensitive cortex. And this is what we found as expected in the synesthetes. But the surprise was that we found exactly the same thing in the controls as well. <laughs> so it looks as if we all unconsciously are mirroring the sensations of others when we watch them. But and probably the most relevant thing for empathy, of course, is studies of pain. So there are now lots of studies showing that we mirror pain. And the one that I did with Tanya Singer, the volunteer lay in the scanner while her friend was sitting next to her outside the scanner. And they were both wired up to receive painful shocks. And arrows on the screen in front of the volunteer indicated when the shocks would be received and by whom. And so as you might expect, when the volunteer receives a shock or sees the arrow indicating the shock is coming, there's a big response in the areas of the brain concerned with emotion and pain. But in fact, the responses in these areas was equally strong when the arrow indicated that their friend would receive the shock. And you can get the same results other people are showing. The same thing, you get, you get a response when you see a fear, an expression of pain in the face in front of you. <coughs> 
And I mean, it's almost obvious that you get an experience of pain when you see a picture of someone with a needle being stuck into their hand. You wince, and it not surprisingly appears in your brain as well. And we like to call this an empathic response, and it seems very similar to the sorts of things that Vernon Lee was talking about. These are automatic, unconscious responses to seeing something out there. But as I said before, it might be better to call it contagion. These responses occur very rapidly, and they can occur without awareness. You would have a fearful response if you see a fearful facial expression. But you get this response even if the fearful facial expression is presented so briefly that you're not actually aware of seeing it. And there are some situations where you can show physiologically that the person is responding in a fear or pain or whatever it may be without actually being consciously aware that this is happening. Now these rapid unconscious responses can be very important for survival. A fearful face is a signal that there's something to be afraid of. Our fearful response to that face prepares us to run away. And likewise, a disgusted facial expression is a signal of contaminated food. And our disgusted response to this facial expression prepares us to fit, spit out the food. And there's actually another advantage of mirroring, perhaps more, a more interesting one, which applies to all these different kinds of mirroring sensations, actions, emotions. Because when we mirror someone, we become actually more similar to them. And this makes communication and cooperation in joint tasks easier. And even there's an experiment claiming that if you imitate the foreign accent of the person talking to you, they will understand you better. <laughs> I wouldn't try it. But it's fairly well established that if you mirror someone super surreptitiously while they're talking to you, they will think you are a nicer person, and they may even give more money to charity afterwards. <laughs> the problem here is, of course, that if they notice that you're imitating them, the effect completely reverses and they think that you're just creepy. <laughs> but as we heard in the previous talk, empathy has really become to mean more than just emotional contagion. We expect the empathic person to be aware that they're responding to the emotion of the other, and also we expect them in some cases to respond appropriately to the emotion of the other. And I think this creates a major problem for these mechanisms of contagion that I've been telling you about. We might feel angry when confronted with an angry face, but is this appropriate? Should we feel afraid? And in particular, if you're, it's very difficult when confronted with an unhappy face not to feel unhappy. But this is probably the worst thing if you want to actually cheer the person up. So there are undoubtedly high-level processes in the brain that control these contagious emotional responses as we were hearing in the last talk, which are very important. But at the moment, but neuroscientists at least know very little about them. And my conclusion for the moment is nevertheless, there's a very important role for happy people with no empathy. <laughs>
does he have feelings? And it's interesting, I've, I've heard quite a few people over the years express their desire to be like him. And there's a whole industry of video games which people buy and use for hours and hours, whether an emotionless killer or assassin going through some jungle or town, eliminating other people with as little feeling displayed as possible, with a kind of absence of signs of emotional expression, like the Clint Eastwood of, his, of the spaghetti westerns, which is still the kind of character that a lot of people identify with, apparently someone who doesn't have empathy. So I do feel that there's a difference between identification and empathy. I think a lot of people are drawn to the image of someone who doesn't actually experience emotions, because it's the aim in many people's lives. They, they expend a huge amount of energy in trying to get rid of any kind of emotional effects. As for the question of mirror neurons, I think you know, there's a great deal of debate about whether these mirror neurons actually exist and what they do if they do exist, and are they the product of social interactions? And they don't actually, from what I understand, it doesn't actually tell us very much about the process of identification to say that we see a firing in these particular parts of the brain. What's interesting from the developmental research is the idea that some of the first forms of motor identification take place at the time that the infant experiences its greatest distress. And this was studied by Scandinavian and then French researchers in the 1920s and 30s. The idea that in the state of motor incoordination of the first few months of life, children will be drawn towards images that seem to offer the promise of wholeness and completeness, often at a motor level, of basically images that present a form of what they are themselves unable to do. So this form comes from the other. It could come from a caregiver, a parent. It could come from another child. And it was studied in, in those years very, very carefully the ways in which children would identify in two, two main periods between three and six months and then between 18 and 24 months. The idea that there'll be a fascination and a capture in reflecting surfaces, either glass or mirror, but also the reflecting surface formed by the eye of a caregiver or by the whole image presented by another person. And Baldwin, James Baldwin, who studied some of these things, some of the first researchers, said that for him this gave the birth of the human ego, which was simultaneously the birth of the alter ego, to the extent that we're alienated in an image that comes from the outside. We become an image that is not ourselves. And that was used to explain some of the interesting questions to do with spatial symmetry and the acquisition of handedness at the time. What's interesting is to see how that then develops in that second phase, 18 to 24 months, the idea that it's less the capture in the whole image or the reflecting surface, but rather how that's perceived by a third party, that important changes were studied by the researchers. What happens to your relation to the mirror image or the image of your body form when there's someone else holding you or there's someone else looking? There has to be a kind of sanctioning of your image. Your image has to be given to you. You have to be soldered to your image which brings in the whole question of the subjectivity of one's carers. So you have these, this very, very interesting sequence which starts off with an infant's experience of fragmentation or lack of coordination, basically a lack. An aspiration towards an image, an image is incorporated and identified with to give the, the form of the human body. Unfortunately, what gives you your unity is also what takes it away because it's an image which is outside yourself. And then, last moment, when that image is symbolized, represented, pinned down, linked to you by the words, the actions, the love coming from the caregiver. And at all, all those different moments, there can be different vicissitudes depending on the situation of each individual infant, which open up a lot of fascinating questions about phenomena linked to identification that we see later on in life, perhaps like Fiona's experience 
in the brain scanner to do with her arms, the difference between the body schema and the body image. Also, phenomena where people's image is experienced as being separated from themselves. All the strange, many strange experiences of the body that neurologists have taught us about. Can I just, before you, yeah, should go to, can I just ask you something about that? When you talk about Clint Eastwood having no feelings or seeming to have no feelings, I think there's a funny thing at play there, which is that the person looking at him is identifying with the fact that he appears not to have feelings, but he probably does. And they're probably the same hidden feelings that I, the viewer, am having. The baby, <laughs> um, the baby mirroring, I'm just trying to find an example, but when, you know, when you're little and, uh, and you have people going, isn't she a lovely little girl? And you look at them and you, I, you remember thinking, what are they talking about? <laughs> you're both pleasure, receiving pleasure from the, you know, from the approbation of, uh, isn't she a lovely little girl? You genuinely don't know what they're talking about, but it seems to give them pleasure to say it. And is that what you're saying? I mean, I, I, not, not exactly, but because. But that's it. And so you wave back and go, "Yes, I am a lovely little girl," but you, you may not be at all. But you have no notion one way or the other. But then your identity is split between those two poles, between what other people have said about you, the lovely little girl, and your own refusal of those things that come from outside. And has neuroscience got anything to offer on that? <laughs> not on the last point, but going back to Clint Eastwood, there was this very interesting experiment done by a Russian filmmaker in the 20s, Kuleshov Effect, where he took a Russian movie star who was a bit like Clint Eastwood, I think, and he, had, and he used the montage effects that they were very keen on, so he cut his face into different contexts. So you saw the face, and then you saw a bowl of soup, and you saw the face, and then you see a coffin with a young girl in it. You can, all, you can find this on YouTube. I think. And the results are very striking that the people who watch this would say, yes, isn't he marvellous? With minimal changes in his expression, he can il illustrate the feelings that go with these contexts. And of course, the point was that there's an identical shot in every <laughs> case. And we've replicated this in the scanner. I mean, there's really no point in doing it because we got exactly the same result. But the, I mean, it shows again, this is sort of the other way around, how much what we read in other people's expressions depends on what we expect, given the context and what we know about is it. Is, it, is empathy a sort of narcissism, then, actually, mm. that it is, if I believe that I feel what the other person is yeah. feeling, but actually I'm just feeling it? Yeah. <laughs> Which is quite a flaw with, your, with the experiment. Or I could feel it. Yeah. And there's the other, I mean, what I always think very cynically is this idea that when you see someone in pain, you want to help them. You mm. want to stop them being in pain. But possibly the reason is because it's so painful for you. Mm. That would be a very cynical version. And there's even a nice experiment where they had some, it's a typical social psychology experiment, say it's fake. The person comes into a waiting room. It is filmed, unbeknown to them, while two research students come in carrying a TV set and one of them proceeds to drop it with his foot. And they, they look at the expression of the person in the room and they show an exp you know, sympathy or empathy or whatever, they show an expression of pain when the person drops it on their foot but they show an even bigger expression of pain when the person who drops it on their foot is looking at them at the time. <laughs> so is this to say, I am very sympathetic? Yes. Exactly, and, and, and it's interesting as well that in some of those experiments, the physiological indices that are supposedly linked to empathy go down after the, the point of the helping behavior which might imply that the physiological indices of the empathy were actually indices of guilt. Or relief not to be that person. Yeah, or, or enjoyment at their suffering. <laughs> yes. Actually, because I was getting ready for this, I was talking to somebody on the telephone about this this morning, and I was saying, when I go into work at night, I have to play opposite an actor, and he's going through a bit of a bad time. I say, how are things? He goes, not good. I go, oh, never mind. And we get on with it. And then we play these parts where we are very, very empathetic to each other as characters. I have to cauterize my natural feeling for that man in order for us to do this other thing together, which is to dance, a dance of empathy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I do cauterize it quite completely. I am not, otherwise, I couldn't get on and do the play with him. Mm -hmm. 
But I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head with the, your comment about the least that the identification isn't with the absence of emotion, but with the tension between the surface absence of emotion and the emotion tension. that will be there. <laughs> Can we maybe take Fiona's image of the dance and think about <coughs> bodies in empathy? Because it seems to me that a lot of um, the neuroscientific work sort of begins with the body and then and goes from that to the mind. Chris says in his book, we know a lot about what is in the minds of others by simply observing the way they act upon the world, by the way they move. And it struck me reading that, that, that a lot of um, the process of acting must start with imitating the physical um, movements of how you see of how you see a character, or, or with sort of getting, from, or maybe not, maybe if it comes from the light. Like, how yeah. do bodies and minds work? We can't describe each other. We are not there to describe each other. That's not what we're trying to do. It, uh, that would be called mimicking. Mm. And that has absolutely no feeling in it. In fact, comedy in general, mimicry in comedy, is a very cold form of communication to gain, I don't know, pleasure or cause pleasure in others that reflects well on yourself. It, it, it really is the opposite of what. I think acting and empathy would be about because our behavior patterns are so defined by our childhoods, by our inherited tendencies. Um, I have a nephew who lives in France and he, he has some gestures that are the same as mine, so they must be inherited through a different track other than mimetic. So it would be foolish if we were just trying to take the action of somebody else. On the contrary, one is trying to reveal something about yourself whilst believing that you are identifying with another person. And oddly, it's this synthesis of yourself and the notion of the other person that produces, when it's successful, something that a, a very, very astute audience, because we're all astute watching each other, believe or can choose to believe. And so where do the gestures, because each character does have a different way of walking or a different way of gesturing, what, where does that come from? Well, you know, Michael Bryant, who played Ratty in, in, the, in, the, um, in the Wind of the Willows some years ago at the National, he said, I think Ratty's a guy awfully like me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's quite true because, of course, a lot of very bad students say, I think Hamlet's a guy like me, and you think, no. Hamlet's huge, you're tiny, and your job is to sort of reach beyond yourself to expand your mind to what it is that Hamlet, but whether Hamlet walks or talks similarly to you is probably the case that he does. The reason why actors train at all is to enhance their ability to play and be in charge of a wider range of mannerisms than will be defined by the locality or their family mannerisms. That's really all they're doing. And sometimes they do it to a fault, so they become so neutral and open, they actually don't reflect anything particular. It's this weird connection between what is unescapable in yourself, or inescapable in yourself, and, and your ability to jump out of yourself and embrace often feelings way beyond your uh, natural disposition, or hopefully experience in life, that produces a fusion that allows an audience who themselves do not have to experience these terrible things that you're replaying for them, but they can believe them enough that they can replay them in their head and learn something from them. That seems to me the, 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 um, the exchange. Um, and sticking with bodies, could you tell us maybe about the experiment, um, is it Gunnar Johansson? Um, the experiment with the, with, the joints, with the lights on the joints. I thought that might be No, helpful. this is just showing that simply the way we move is very informative. So what Johansson did was he attached lights, like nine lights to all the joints, and filmed people moving. And then what you see on the screen is just the nine dots. And as soon as they start moving, you can see what, that is a person walking or running, you can see what direction they're going in, you can see what sex they are, you can even see whether they're happy or sad. Again, you can find that on the internet, and they even give you a little bar so you can make it go be more or less female. So it's just showing that we're incredibly attuned to these very minimal types of cues. You can remove everything but the movement, and you can still see what's going on. Yeah, and we fall in love with that. Very often we fall in love with the way somebody turns their head. For some reason we recognize something in the gesture, which is pretty well the same as everybody else turning their head, but it isn't. Yeah. And would you say any of that comes into acting, even, even if it's not part of the original process? You certainly can't manipulate 
a hundred, three hundred or a thousand people to, to notice the way you turn your head. Uh, usually in a story, of course, somebody else is falling in love with you while you turn your head in that way. And the audience replay that in their own mind. They go, oh, that's like when so-and-so turned their head and I liked it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, it's Beckett, actually, who, who really begins to do that more than any other playwright, which is rather than describe or prescribe to the audience what they should feel, there's a wonderful bit in Footfalls where a character just says, a little later, when she was quite forgotten, she began to... A little later, when as though she had never been, it never been, began to walk at nightfall. Now, obviously the phrasing is tell you, a little later she began to. Then it's paused, the audience panic and think, why is there a pause? In that pause, Beckett is allowing you to have whatever feeling you have about her, but also to have whatever feeling you have about yourself. It's a sort of vacuum, it's a sort of free fall out of an airplane without a parachute. He stops taking responsibility for what you're feeling and allows you to feel whatever you're feeling yourself. I think that's a very useful thing. Um, it's a useful thing. But it's, it is like the dots. In the end, it's very hard to change the dots of your behavior. And bodies and minds maybe an identification? Yeah, I mean, I just think that there's something very problematic about saying that one can tell by looking at someone whether they're happy or sad. Doesn't the whole of human experience, world literature, everything, tell us that you can't tell when someone is happy or sad? And that sometimes affects are compounds. Sometimes an affect can transform into another affect. Longing can be transformed into anxiety. Desire can transform into fear. And it, it seems that we're taking a step back um, hundreds of years to say that you know we can study experimentally pain, disgust, happiness, sadness through facial expressions, through neuroimaging, and so on. You, certainly you can say things about the expression of what culturally some people might agree on, but you know, the simple point is made again and again that if there's any link between the experience of an emotion and the expression of emotion, since expression of emotion is linked in a communicative matrix to other people, then presumably any situation or social context which has an effect on how and when and why we frown or grimace or smile will then have an effect on the emotion, on the, the experience of the emotion. Very, very simple point that, that's been made dozens of times. So once we recognize that there's a difference between Culture, what, what's seen culturally as the expression of an emotion, like a smiling face, we have to recognize that that tells us very, very little about any emotional experience that the person is having, about com the difference between compound emotions and emotions that supposedly aren't compound. And, I mean, it just, it just seems to me that it's very, very far-fetched to think that there are separate things like disgust, pain, fear, happiness, sadness that you can find in the brain. So this is very much the sort of thing that the Professor of English says in Chris Fifth's book, so I'm sure he's got a ready answer. <laughs> well, I deliberately choose fear and disgust uh, with the idea that these are particularly basic emotions which are more resistant to cultural effects. And there's some very interesting work on what the ex expressing fear and disgust actually does to your face. So fear, you widen the eyes. But how do you know that's fear? Well, no, I mean, I, let's, okay, this, this expression, the expression that widens the eyes actually increases your visual field, so you're more able to see what's happening, whether there's some predator or something on the periphery. Disgust, and then I think this is a particularly good use of imaging. If you image someone while they're showing an expression of disgust, you find that their nasal pathway is contracted. That's what the ring thing does. Your eyes close down. And this, again, is a way of keeping out nasty things, nasty smells, nasty sights. So this is, I thought this was very interesting. This is a very basic technique of changing your face in response to certain kinds of, different kinds of environmental threat. And that's why it's a very useful signal for other people and indeed to imitate. But I would entirely agree that more complex emotional expressions will be different, will have cultural overlay.
but that still won't deter me from trying to study them. But, but fear, fear and disgust are not simple things. They're incredibly complicated. And if you want to know something about disgust, if you listen to what people who have what are called culturally eating disorders have to say about their experiences, you'll, you'll find that they're not simple things that can be determined by a facial expression or by activity of the sympathetic nervous system. I mean, it just seems to me it's, it's like... It's just mythology to think that we can segregate these different basic feelings and study them experimentally. Rather, you have to listen to someone talk for a hell of a long time mm -hmm. to have an idea of what exactly it is they mean or when they actually have those, those feelings. Wouldn't you say that most people are roughly the same and are pretty unhappy and pretty happy during most part of their lives? And that empathy is the bit of is the area where someone, for some unknown reason, is able to not read the obvious signal of whatever the person's giving, but is able to read the person behind the signal they're giving. And that that is why we're impressed by our own sense of empathy. Uh, you can easily tell if somebody's disgusted or, or frightened. But most people, well, you can tell if they're frightened. A lot of people live in pretty well permanent fear, and it's either, you know, the whole the whole of Great Britain, when you get off an airplane at Heathrow, mm -hmm. I feel the whole country's in fear. You see a tight-lipped country. You don't see that in Spain. I mean, people in England look frightened all the time. So, of course, it would be rather, you know, simplistic to say, well, the whole of England is frightened, but they do look frightened. They're tense, and they go, what? You know, they're, they're short, they're kept. There's a whole cultural area of that behaviour, which is, I'm being, you know, crude with it, but you... It would be much more difficult for me to tell whether an Italian was frightened or not, because they are more relaxed culturally, or tend to be. And I think, but when you see the individual, and uh, you're at a party, or which is maybe much nearer the idea of falling in love, which is at its beginning empathy, doesn't it, is that you can see the person behind the person. Or whether the word seeing is wrong. You feel the person behind the person. You fall out of love. Well, if you're drawn to somebody, That's when you, really feel you, maybe, yeah. you sense their feeling, whether they're happy or unhappy, and for some reason, it gives you pleasure, even if they're unhappy. Yes, I guess I'm Do you think I'm weird? <laughs> Are you saying weird? It's not how I'd say it. People fall in love in many different ways, and people can only realise many years later, after they've stopped seeing someone, that they actually love them. Yes, well, maybe love is too extreme a thing, but if you're in a group of people, there are some people who one feels drawn to and some people you're not. And they're none the better nor worse people. Some sure, in a sure, group, you know, I, sure. I often have to meet a group of 15 new people and I immediately know the people I'm drawn to. What is it? And play it's the result of empathy, you would say? Well, I'm one, I'm, I mean, I'm asking. <laughs> because you feel like you know these people. It's not sexual attraction. It's not, it's not any of those things. It's just I feel, I can feel their rhythm. Being on the same wavelength. All sorts of things like that, ma'am. And I think, you know, but that is the area of empathy, I would have thought, rather than whether we can detect whether they're. I'm certainly happy optimistic that people are actually most of the time quite good at communicating with each other, rather than it being horrendously difficult and you mm. never really know mm. what other people are thinking. But Dad's point is that, is that you do not know the state of somebody. I mean, you do sometimes hear a terrible story, having known someone for quite a while, and you had no clue that that was the story. And I think Fiona's point is that often the moment of empathy is that you're empathising with something that wouldn't show up on a brain. So that, there's, yeah. that, it's the, mm. that you see the fear and that's, that's a sort of vision thing, but there's also behind that the empathy. Well, the, presumably the brain is involved somehow. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, tell us, Chris. Well, no, I mean, I mean... How is the brain... In, I mean, t tell us about how the brain can do many things at once. Well, it can certainly do many things at once, but I'm, I'm just trying to make the point that if we didn't have a brain, none of us would be happy. No. No. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I, I perfectly agree that we, our understanding of the brain is about a hundredth of a percent or something like that. But it's all going on in there, and eventually more and more relationships will be found. At the moment, our theories are just not good enough. Mm. And so, Darian, would you say they'll never be found? Or? 
No, no, no. I've got, um, I've got some sympathy with, with good research. But I just think... <laughs> It's just Mickey Mouse stuff to think you can you know, isolate these different feelings through neuroimaging. You need a much more sophisticated model. And it's interesting, if you look back to early 20th century research in experimental psychology, loads and loads of this stuff has been disproved you know, by, you know, by people working in Germany and in America in those early years. And all those refutations, or most of them, have been forgotten. If you look back through the medical journals, take something like the role of the hypothalamus in the, the regulation of emotion. Fantastic work refuting misconceptions about that in the 1930s. And all those misconceptions are back on the map today. So I, mean, I, I just find it extraordinary how faculty psychology, which is essentially what, what we've been hearing about, that you can you, know, you get someone to plunge their hand into a bucket of cold water and we can study what's going on in the brain because that's an experience of pain or threaten someone with an electric shock and that will tell us about fear. These things you know, were kind of you know, just seen as absolutely absurd all that time ago and now they're treated as cutting edge science. Um, I think it's before, just before, stuff. Um, before <laughs> the war breaks out on, on either side of us, um, let's open the, uh, the, um, the floor to questions. We have a raving microphone um, here and a question here and here. Well, I, I want to see if I can somehow bring the, the, the two males on the panel slightly closer together, but simply by asking whether if at Chris Frith's end um, there's a sense that the model that's in question is, is somehow linked to an animal model. Um, the human is, is an animal in that sense, and not an animal that speaks necessarily, and therefore has very, very little of that complexity that comes into being with language. And at your end, Darian, it seems to me that without language, we, we don't have quite the, the, um, the huge amount of complexity in the being that, that one is talking about. So that it, it's as if, you know, at one end, we're really talking about the human as animal. Um, you know, discussed in the way that it's portrayed in, in, in when we're talking about animal psychology. Um, and fear, when we're talking about animal psychology, is really what's at play here. And when you use the word disgust and fear, you're talking about all the things that come through uh, human development, language, and culture to, to actually approach them. Now, that is inevitably going to be far more complicated and our brain studies it seems to me are still at a, at a very um, basic level I mean at the level in which humans are all animals and have not yet entered into language and what 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 where the language comes in is the way in which psychologists then describe the nature of their experiments and that makes them seem as if they're dealing with a far more complicated being. Now, I, I just put that to you because I, I want to throw it into the discussion. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly, from my point of view, we would, a good model, from my point of view, is one of a human, is one that is consistent with what we know about the animals, in the sense we're working from the bottom up. And we, so when we talk about fear, we're thinking very much of the kinds of experiments that have been done in animals. And when we talk about the brain, most of what we know about the brain actually comes from work with animals rather than humans, because you can't do it, or at least it's very difficult as yet to look at things like connectivity in the human brain. Um, so that, I think that's absolutely right. And I try and avoid language because it's much too difficult. Yeah. But I have to talk about what I do. <laughs> Could I ask you just about animals and people then, of people, I, I, people who could communicate with animals? Is that an empathetic element that somebody who can make a horse move by thought? Is that the sort of, is that well, empathy? I, guess, I mean, or this is, is very, I mean, that's, that's somewhat controversial. Um, 
I think, yes, if you know animals very well, I'm sure you understand their behavior, and there may be all sorts of things that you're reading without probably quite knowing how you're doing it, mm. which will enable you to control them in, mm. in various ways. But, but I mean, there's the classic okay. case of clever hands, the horse, who could count. And this is actually, I think, going the other way. This is the animals reading the humans, and everybody believed that this horse could actually count until it was studied very closely by a experimental psychologist who found that the trainer was unconsciously giving signals that the horse knew when to stop. So that was the case of where the horse had trained the owner. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, I, mean, I, I think that some studies of animals are much more subtle and more sophisticated than studies of humans. And I don't think that, you know, it's that the research itself is so primitive or that we don't have you know, techniques that would allow good research. It's that some of the basic paradigms that are used in the research are, are childish. You know, things that, that you wouldn't, you know, that you wouldn't be able to get through a GCSE exam on. I mean, take Damasio's work, for example, which is seen as kind of, you know, it's got a very good reputation in, in that field. And, when you look at what he has to say about language, about notions of the self and so on, that stuff, you know, you wouldn't get a GCSE if you were putting forward those arguments. So it seems to me we've got, that there's just a gulf that's developed between different research fields, that you have those disciplines which look at what you call language, representational systems, social constructivism and so on, which show the way in which our experiences, our emotions, our ways of communicating or failing to communicate are linked to the way in which we are grasped by language. And then you have the other disciplines which pay very, very little attention to that. And it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, there's some, some very good studies of animals which use those paradigms, which have sophisticated models of how language works. So I think you know, a lot of attention has got to be paid to the basic philosophical ideas that are imported into theories about empathy and about um, thinking and emotion. But would you say there are pre-linguistic experiences that, that can be thought about in these terms, well, when you say in, in more generalised terms? Thought, when you say thought about, you mean language? Do pre-linguistic experiences exist? No doubt, yeah. I mean, not everything is language. But like, could those therefore be more instinctual and, and therefore fit more into the model that Chris is, is putting forward? Well, maybe they could be, but I don't think Chris is really saying that because I think Chris recognises the importance of language in social interaction. Yes, absolutely. I'm a bit, I'm a bit, I certainly wouldn't have anything to say about Damasio. Um, <laughs> I was, I was, but I'm a bit mystified about these experiments in animals and language that you mentioned. Well, the, the, there are experiments where the, um, done in Toulouse University in southern France, where there's just more attention paid to the philosophical presuppositions of the experimenters. That rather than, let's say, assuming that when a dog has bristling hair when it's about to meet a rival, rather than assuming that the dog feels threatened or the dog is being aggressive, there's careful attention paid to the possibility that the dog is actually pretending to be frightened or pretending to be aggressive in order to gauge the reaction of the other. Just, just, just stuff like that. Um, I think we can hear. Um, my, my feeling is that actually, Fiona, when you started talking about in the movement of a head, someone can fall in love and there was something you said in the next point that you had, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it touched on the emotion that someone is feeling and not showing, and I think that's what we're starting to get to now. And for me, a lot of what had been spoken about before was more about projection and identification and not about true empathy. And I think true empathy, come from, from what you said, it, it hit me then, is seeing the feeling that isn't shown and the connection and perhaps for me that is true empathy. But the question that I have is, if anyone agrees with that, um, how the sort of turn of the head thing, how, how are we so affected by this? Do we have the freedom 
to fall in love in our own way when we've seen so many people fall in love on TV and in films and, mm-hmm. and things like that? Have we lost the ability to fall in love with people who aren't Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, thankfully, most people don't try and fall in love with Marilyn Monroe or her, or her prototype. I mean, they don't. I mean, most people don't. And there may be a bit like the dog pretending to bristle. There, I think there's an element where a lot of men have to believe that Marilyn Monroe is it, when in fact they much prefer their wife, who's dark-haired and doesn't in any way do that Marilyn Monroe. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, she did turn her head well. She did turn her head, yes. She could turn a head and she could turn her own head. And, no, I was going to just say something that maybe that might connect with that, but is the opposite thing, which is that there are also language-inherited systems that we learned, of course, in Shakespeare. In Shakespeare, a lot of things are on the iambic pentameter. Ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum. But every now and then, quite subconsciously, Shakespeare reverses them, and they go tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti. And notably, the beginning of Macbeth is, instead of ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, is when shall we three meet again? So it's tum, ti, when she we meet me again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain, when the hurly body's done, when the battle's after one, that would be our set of sun, where the place upon the heath there to meet with Macbeth. Fair is foul, and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. So it's interesting that witches would choose to not speak on the iambic, but speak on the opposite rhythm. Now, that's both linguistic and actually not linguistic, because nobody in the audience would know that. The other thing is the word Macbeth doesn't scan. Now, whether there's a pre-linguistic way of that being the case when we like somebody or don't like them in a room, I think interests me, which is to do with the head turn, much more beyond the head turn, is after the head turns, and it settles again. That's also having an effect on you. The way they pick up a teacup, or don't, is, is a bit like that, is that there seems to be, I shouldn't probably I'm saying this, a sort of conceptual framework of things that we like and don't like individually, and when we recognize them, we recognize them. And in Shakespeare, notably, in the plays, people who fall in love very rarely speak to each other at all until after they've fallen in love. He never ever tries to say why they've fallen in love. They just fall in love and. I think the, the word pretend um, is also very significant because it, feels, it seems to me that a lot of the complexity comes from a self-consciousness that we have as humans and um, a way in which we um, are aware of what other people are thinking, we're aware of what we want other people to think of us, but what I, where I think we really experience um, the empathetic response is when someone can see beyond that and think, I know you're not really what you're, what you're, what you're putting across, you're something else, you're something deeper. And whether the empathy actually is the other person completely understanding you, or whether what we fall in love with or what we feel drawn to is just that person seeing that we're deeper than what other people might read externally. And I think that that's, and I think that goes with the baby and mother relationship as well, that the baby wants to be second guessed. The baby doesn't just want the assumption that when it cries, then it needs to be fed or its nappy needs to be changed. It, it needs, it wants to, for someone to think there's something else you know, the baby might not even know what it is, but just the idea that somebody might get that there's something beyond what can be measured scientifically or what can be read from the external um, behavior. And I, I think, you know, that is what we fall in love with when we fall in love with people, is just someone seeing or imagining that there's something deeper which gives us a deeper sense of ourselves, and that's a... Uh, a very attractive thing to be connected to. Whether you ever really feel understood by the person you're in love with, I think is still very much in question. But you're with someone who's willing to believe there's something more there than, the, and I think that is the same that happens in acting, that the, that the, the audience um, gets that whatever the text is being spoken, that there's something beneath that, and that's the excitement that, that the actor and the audience can have together, that whatever I'm saying, whatever the, the playwright has written, that there's something more to be known about the character yes. that, that I'm playing. Uh, recently, Bruno Ganz, the great German actor, played Hitler, and it is a fantastic performance, because there would be no 
learning or experience if one just came with all one's reservations about Hitler. Nor does he try and justify Hitler, he merely plays him. But Bruno Ganz is a man with a huge soul, if one's allowed to use a word like that. He do, he's a remarkable person. So to have this sort of lake of sorrow, which is what Bruno is in life, actually, a sort of, he's just a particularly beautiful, sorrowful, he's not a maudlin man, because he laughs a lot, playing Hitler, is a fantastic experience for the audience because you get to meet, I'm sure he's m a much more sympathetic than Hitler might have been had you, had you met Hitler. It is exactly what you said. You have this profound depth of human consciousness meeting the behavior pattern of the band called Hitler. And therefore the film is very successful because against your better judgment, you are sympathetic to that person as he goes through his terrible actions. And at the end of it, you understand something. Um, maybe just before that, I would, could, could, could this relate to the sort of the psychoanalytic encounter? In well, yeah, I mean, it's a great example because it shows that with a great performance, there's that margin, that enigmatic margin, which means that you have to ask questions about a character rather than assuming that we understand it. It's exactly the same in, in analytic work, that the clinician has to, at a certain point, start to embody an enigma for the patient so that the patient can engage once again with that question, what does the other want, or what am I for the other? And then hopefully you'll have some kind of access to how the response to that question had crystallized for them in their childhood. So yeah, absolutely. So it, it's always about keeping a margin of non-comprehension active. Yeah, um, can you just shout? I think the, the colorblind Mary, the Mary the color scientist, <coughs> oh, sorry, Mary the color scientist story is particularly about qualia. So the idea is that you could know everything about the neural mechanisms of color perception, but you wouldn't know what it was like to experience color. And I guess I would perfectly agree that I could know everything about how we respond, how the you know, brain mechanisms for some sort of emotional responses, but that wouldn't tell me what it's like. And I would agree with that entirely, but it might tell me, enable me to predict to some extent behavior. And I th personally, I think that's where <coughs> language and culture comes in, because the way we know what it's like is actually some sort of construct that we build up through our upbringing, through discussions with others, through history, through reading novels and whatever it may be. And that's that's a different story. So I'm, I agree, but I'm not telling you what it's like that to be fearful. Quite yep. mm? That leads to be quite tenuous and kind of changeable. It seems to be a But in the end, at the bottom, I mean, the purpose of pain for the animal in us is to avoid hurt and to take consequences of that. And you can, and that could happen at an entirely non-linguistic level and without any quality. So there's a sort of basis to it, at least in relation to pain. But when we talk about it, yes, that becomes another matter. Yeah. I just wanted to build on that last 
Richard, um, about uh, culture that you mentioned. And um, uh, I wondered what any of you thought about the work of Steven Pinker in the Better Angels of Our Nature, working, um, building on the work of, of Peter Singer, this idea that maybe human beings have become more empathetic because of um, because of text, because of theatre, because of film, the idea that um, that having the ability to to read about the way other people think and give has extended the tribe, so we don't just care about the immediate family; we start to care about other social groups. Is there any truth in this, um, or is this just wishful thinking? Perhaps. Yeah, and then maybe Fiona, because it's theatre must be. I, I, mean, I have to say, I have not read the book. I'm also somewhat optimistic. And to describe another of these naive experiments, the, when the empathic response to pain that I talked about, what I didn't mention is the dark side of this, is that you, if you, there's an experiment done in China where you see a Chinese person having a needle stuck into them or a Caucasian person having a needle stuck into them, and the volunteers are Chinese or Caucasian, and as you might expect, the Caucasians respond to needles being stuck into Caucasians, and the Chinese respond to needles being stuck into Chinese people. So there's a very much an in-group, out-group effect. But you can overcome this, of course, by enlarging the size of the in-group. And I think that might be what you were describing. So if you have someone in your team from a different race, then you start showing this very, what I call an empathic response. So I. I'm, I believe that it's possible that we can enlarge the size of the in-group, as it were, so this goes in globalization. But is, so isn't that, isn't that group. another name for that, genocide? With the in-group be uh, animals wearing clothes making sound with their mouths. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I need to catch up with the genocide. Just, can you just... Yeah, the, the idea that you can enlarge the size of an in-group. What does that mean? Well, uh, I, mean that's, I mean, London, the success of London is that people who would have found each other intolerable 40 years ago seem to be completely at ease with each other now. Whether we're empathetic to each other, we're certainly neutral about each other. Whether that's a... I'm not sure that is empathy. Say that. But... <laughs> We're neutral. You really think people are neutral today? I think pretty neutral. I think it's amazing how people live in the city uh, <laughs> all together and we don't kill each other. It's phenomenal. I think it's, I, I think it's wonderful. But I, I would have just said that culture or plays or theatre or films or whatever, the, 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 the watching of other people, whether it's Clint Eastwood, whoever's behaviour you're watching, it might teach you something. The purpose of tragedy, they say, is that when you experience tragedy outside yourself, it does free you uh, from the expectation that your life will not be tragic. All our lives are tragic because they will all end in our death. And in a hundred years' time, none of us who are being born today or existing will exist. It's, it is a really sad thing. <laughs> Very sad. Um, <laughs> So there is an inbuilt tragedy, maybe in a Freudian terms, of what is going to happen to us. But I actually think, I don't think of it in terms of tribal groups. But the point of looking at someone on a stage or in a film or in a book or in a novel, usually the novel can be placed in another planet even, is that you learn something about the infinite universe that's inside your head. That's where I think the empathy is self-referential in a way. That the more you know or experience of the human condition, the more you get a chance to be the person who's had a bigger experience of the human condition without getting hurt physically. Uh, and uh, that seems to be a good thing. But I'm not sure it makes you a nicer person. I know many very well-read people who are horrible people. <laughs> and many writers who are horrible people, and none of us seem to have any ability, when it's to our own behavior, to view it. We seem incapable of seeing ourselves. But yet, the attempt to do that seems to be what culture is, I think. Well, I think on that note, 
I hope that this hour and a half has, has in a minor way, extended all our um, sympathies and empathetic <laughs> capabilities, and I'm sure a glass of wine will add to the experience. So um, I'd like to thank our three marvellous speakers um, for a great discussion.